Oh, it's a fun time. It's muscle building time. We're gonna, you're going to love this episode. We love talking about this stuff. Oh, by the way, we're going to give somebody free access to Maps Prime so you can get better mobility, better connection, build more muscle, get better performance, and look amazing. That's what happens when you do those things. You look amazing. Here's how you can win access to Maps Prime. Leave us a comment in the first 24 hours. Help us, help us with the YouTube algorithm, okay? If we pick your comment... As the winner, you'll get free access to Maps Prime. You also want to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications so you know when we come underneath and say, hey, guess what? You won a free program. Also, uh, we are running a promotion right now. Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and the Prime Bundle, all 50% off. You can find them at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code uh, June Prime. That's right, June Prime with no space for the discount. All right, enjoy this podcast. Let's talk about the 11 ways to build muscle faster. 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 Everybody, faster. Everybody wants to build muscle, but everybody wants to build it faster. <laughs> Hell yes, mm. I do. No, this is a good topic because uh, actually I think what's going to happen in this discussion is people will listen and realize that they're not doing something from what we're talking about here. You know, building muscle's tough. It's not easy. It's funny, we... I, 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 we, I talk about this on, on a lot of podcasts I'm on now, especially when I'm talking about to, to women about building muscle, is that it's, a, it's not an easy process. It takes a lot of time. It can be very challenging. And there's a, oftentimes there's things that we do or don't do that just slow the process down. Mm -hmm. And some of them are simple, um, but oftentimes overlooked. So I think we should definitely cover this subject because uh, I know these are pitfalls I ran into that I had issues with, my clients did. Well, I'm also excited to do this too because a lot of times you may be building muscle and you don't think you are. So the idea behind this, like when we first kind of created this was, you know, let's give people kind of like a checkoff list of, are you are you hitting the, the big 11 things mm -hmm. to build muscle as fast as you can? Because what can happen sometimes is the scale doesn't move and you start to stray away from some of these things. Right. You mm -hmm. start to freak out or adjust or move or do things differently because, oh my God, my goal was to build as much muscle as possible and my scale is either staying the same or maybe even it dropped a pound and so you start freaking out. And so, uh, you know, I would have, you know, and I didn't quite organize it the way we organized this episode today, but I'd have kind of a list of things similar to this that I'd, I'd go over with my clients and say, listen, are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Are you doing this? If we're doing all these things, okay, and if I promise you we're changing your body composition. Even if you think we're not, we, we're on the right track. We're, we're checking all the boxes. Right. Now, the first thing, which I think is the most important and, and the most basic, is to focus on strength. Now, I know eventually when you get advanced, this one changes because you're not going to get stronger forever all the time. If that were the case, I think I'd be, you know, I'd be lifting thousands of pounds in each one of my exercises. So at some point this changes, but in the beginning and in the intermediate, uh, this is the most important thing. It's if the you most can, tangible way to actually yes. be able to measure your progress. And yes. I think that that's, that's just one of those things that if we, if, if you want to be serious about this and, and this is where all this stuff matters and why we have this all stacked uh, the way it is because to be efficient in building muscle we have to really be critical of all these uh, you know types of, of ways of measuring it it's also one of the first places it goes when you fall off for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. so it's such an easy place for me to go back and measure like oh am i on the right track again like if you if i take a week or two off especially if i take two weeks or beyond where i've been inconsistent and in not mm -hmm. lifting one of the first things i see that i start to drop or lose is my strength so it's also one of the best ways for me to know that, okay, I'm back on the right track when I start to see that go up. And your measure is not, oh, what's my PR and I'm not PRing now. It's like, where were, where did you start yeah. when you got Progress. back? Yeah. Where did I start when I got back into training again or back to being consistent with all the things I'm doing now and how am I progressing from there? Yeah. Some of the best advice I got as a kid working out was exactly this. We had a family friend who used to be a bodybuilder. He was a chiropractor. And as a kid working out, anytime we'd see this person, I was always like, oh man, I can't, I can't wait to ask him questions because he was the buffest guy that I knew. And I finally, I remember one day I took him aside and I built up the courage to, to ask this guy. And I said, hey, what are the most, what's the most important things I can do? And he said, you know, eat a lot of high quality food, 
and get strong. And I remember thinking like, what do you mean? Just get strong. He goes, look, if you double your squat, if you double your bench press, I promise you, you'll be bigger. (laughs) I promise you, you're going to have more muscle. Your your body will need to get bigger. And nothing, nothing has consistently built more muscle on me and on my clients than just getting stronger consistently. You're, you can get stronger and not see muscle for a little while, but if you keep getting stronger, eventually you'll see more muscle on right, your body. Right, because you can be getting better at this, and we'll cover this, right, the skill and things like that, but ultimately, if you are sending a signal to the body that you need to get stronger, then it's also telling the body we should build more muscle. You know, In order for us to get stronger, one of the most efficient ways that we can be stronger is to add muscle, to build muscle. So that is like the loudest signal that you can send to the body to build the muscle. Right. And I mean, this was the part of the cornerstone of the first MAPS program, which is MAPS Anabolic, is, uh, you know, get stronger. And people who don't necessarily focus on this, who go to the gym and focus on the burn or the sweat or the pump, They'll follow a program like that and they'll be like, I can't believe the results that I'm getting. I'm like, well, yeah, strength is the foundational pursuit. That's the thing that above all that muscle does is it contracts and allows you to move things, lift things. uh, And as those muscles get bigger, you can lift more. So focus on strength, especially if you're in that beginner to intermediate stage, especially if you're in the first few years of your training career. If if you get stronger at some of those very important exercises, your squats and your deadlifts and your overhead presses and your bench presses and your rows, and you do so consistently, you will build muscle. That's just basically uh, yeah. the bottom line. Now, the second one, also very important, and this one took me a long time to figure out, was training frequency. You know, I was, I'm old enough to remember when we were all told to train each body part once a week. Mm-hmm. This was law. This wasn't just a recommendation. This was the law. Like, if you wanted to build muscle, how dare you work out your shoulders more than once a week? You have to rest them for seven days. Well, yeah. What a mistake. The thing there is the rest, because we know that rest is a vital component in building muscle, but their definition of the rest was just off, right? So we would would destroy one muscle group, and we'd think the rest of the week, we have to to stay away from that muscle group and let it build back and and develop, uh, you know, as it should. But really what we should be doing is adding more activity to, to aid in the recovery of it and actually helps to promote a muscle group more effectively and to, to be able to touch that same muscle group with you know a bit less intensity so we can get more volume well I, I remember even as a trainer I actually misunderstood this I actually I thought and I even taught this for a while that if my body was sore still um, there's not only was do I not need to train that muscle again it, it was that, bad it was bad yeah. yeah that that you know and i used to say it like this that oh you know you're tearing and breaking down when you go in and you train and when you intensely train and if you come back in two or three days and that muscle is still sore and you go train it again you're just tearing and breaking down again and you're never allowing yourself to repair and grow mm-hmm. so and there's there's some truth to this but i abused it to the point where i thought okay it was all about intensely training and hammering the muscles as hard as I could, and then it's all about as giving it as much rest as I possibly could, then then hit it again. And I would never want to touch that muscle for at least seven days before I did it again. Bro, this was such a yeah. mind blowing revelation for me the first time I applied this. And by the way, when I'm talking about frequency, uh, I mean that your volume and your intensity are still controlled, but the amount of times you train the muscle is more often. So what I mean by that is, it's the difference between let's say hitting your chest on Monday for 21 sets versus doing seven sets three days a week. You're still doing 21 sets for the whole week. Same amount. Same amount, but the difference is rather than doing them all in one workout, you've got triple the frequency. Triple the frequency with the same volume will give most people better results. And I find this to be more true, especially for people who really have a challenge building muscle. Hard gainers seem to do the best with this, where I take their total volume and I divide it up among more frequent workouts. They seem to be to do much better. And when I did this for myself, it blew my mind partially because I was, Adam, like you, I thought, oh, you never train a muscle group more than that, more frequently, especially if it's sore. But I remember when I first applied this, I trained body parts when they were a little sore. And I noticed not only did they not get more sore, they actually felt a little better. And oh my gosh, I'm getting stronger. 
and I'm building more muscle, what the hell is going on here? Well, the mm -hmm. most important part that you just mentioned right now is actually explaining how you divided the same volume up. Yes. So the, the next mistake that I made was, okay, I finally, and I don't remember exactly the study that I read when I came across this, but I, I finally read the research around frequency and it says, you know, two to three times a week is ideal for the most muscle, right? So then all I did was take the same level, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. intensity mindset that I was that one day. Just weekend, doubled the set. And then I doubled it or tripled it, you know, to throughout the week. And then I didn't see that much progress from that whatsoever. So you have to understand that as you increase frequency, you also have to reduce the intensity. And intensity can be driven because of uh, by reducing it through volume, or then how hard, or and or how hard you're training in right. the workout. Because that that is where that part is true that I that I believed before, which is if you are hammering it that hard two, three times a week and never allowing the body to ever recover, then you can get stuck in that recovery track. Yes, and now here's the thing. A lot of the things that get communicated in the fitness space, uh, especially in the early days, were coming from these really genetically gifted individuals. And I use this example all the time to illustrate kind of what I'm talking about. But if you look at the, the genetic ability of your body to build muscle, there's a spectrum, right? On one end is... Very, very, your body just doesn't build muscle. On the other end is, are, are your bodybuilders. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. And to use a different example, if you look at height is a good example of this, right? On one end, you have people who are seven feet tall. The other end, you have people with dwarfism, right? In real life, forget watching basketball games, for, forget going to NBA. How often have you ever seen someone that's seven feet tall, right? Yeah. Almost never. If you did, you'll remember it because it's so rare. That's how rare extreme muscle building genetics are. Now, why is this important? Because a lot of the information we got and in, in, in still permeates comes from these genetically gifted individuals that make up 0.01% of the population. Part of what makes them genetically gifted is they send a muscle building signal and their body is in positive building mode for a week or two weeks. The average person, that signal lasts like 24 to 48 hours. It's gone after that. After that, your body's not trying to build more muscle, even if you're sore. So this is why some people can work a body part once a week, get great results, but why most people do better working the body part two or three days a week. Now, of course, you got to control the volume and the intensity, so you're not doing 21 sets on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but you're doing what I said earlier, which is seven sets Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But there's other benefits to this. Number one, you're fresher for all seven sets, right? Because if you do 21 sets in one workout, by the time you get done with six or seven sets, the rest of the workout is like, you're just kind of well, hanging in there and you're getting a pump. But when you, you're fresh, you tend to focus on more effective exercises. You're stronger. You don't do these finishers that tend to be at the end of this long, super long workout. You do the more effect, and you have this triple frequency and you also practice more often. Well, yeah, in practice. This that's where the athletic mind, you know, kind of went in this direction and realized like if if you look at it like I'm I'm playing in you know, you know, a high intensity game, like something like that that's going to be a bit damaging on the body, but I if I was to do that multiple times a week and that's going to be taxing on your body. It's the same type of of mentality going into the workouts if if that's always going to be my mindset of crushing this this workout uh you know it's gonna be really taxing on your body your body's not gonna have a chance to really fully recover versus practicing and, and going a little bit mm -hmm. lighter uh you know really practicing these same moves uh and adjusting things accordingly to then feel fresh feel like you're energized mm -hmm. uh leading into like let's say every now and then you're going to test your abilities now now the next one that i think goes hand in hand with increasing the frequency of how much you're training is also incorporating priming and mobility work. Um, this was something too, way later in my career, I, I did I finally figure Bro, all this. This piece. gets in the way for so many people I know. for building muscle. I know. Well, I think uh, as if you were to tell 22 year old me about this, I, I know that I would, it would be tough to get it through to my head. It would tough to, cause I, I would see it as like, um, Oh, this is like, you know, this is like uh, yoga, flexibility stuff. I, I'm trying to build as much muscle as yeah. I possibly want. This, how I'm not getting sore from this. I'm not sweating from this. It's not really hard. Like, 
you know, I'm spending 10 or 10 minutes before I get started in my workout. I could be doing three more sets of something intensely inside mm -hmm. my workout. And so the young kid in me uh, thought it was a waste of time in my pursuit of building the most muscle. It wasn't till later did I realize how much this would accelerate mm -hmm. my muscle building problem. No, if you could, if you could give a point, a score, I should say, to an exercise, let's say, let's say you could give squats a 10, right? On a scale of one to 10, for building muscle, let's say squats score a 10. That doesn't mean doing squats any way you want will give you a 10. The 10 comes from squats done well, full range of motion, being connected, um, feeling in the muscles that are supposed to be worked. Good control. Good control. That's what gives it the 10. The worse you do squats, the less points you get for doing them in terms of its muscle building ability. I think back to when I was a kid, Working out the first time I started doing squats, I remember the difference in my leg development from doing half squats to doing full squats. It was like a completely different exercise. Same thing with shoulder presses. Same thing with the bench press, right? The fuller range of motion with good control, it was like I was doing a brand new exercise in terms of its effectiveness. It makes that big of a difference. And a lot of people, because they don't prime properly, because they don't work on mobility properly, they're not able to do some of the most effective exercises, or they do those exercises, mm. but they can't do them effectively. Yeah, I look at it too as you get a stock car that has all these governings on them to not allow you to go the certain speed. You know the engine is is fully capable of going, mm -hmm. uh, but the the systems aren't in place to be able to handle that kind of stress it's going to place on the car. It's the same with the the body has is very smart. It. it it adjusts and makes sure that, you know, these ranges of motion and these types of activities, you don't apply too much of what you already could produce uh, to, because you're going to injure yourself. And so we're working against these systems that we already have. So priming itself will really unlock a whole amount of new potential uh, for you to produce force. Not to mention the amount of muscle fibers that you recruit when you do an exercise actually is directly correlated to the amount of strength and muscle you gain from that exercise. So when you look at muscles, if you were to look at them under a microscope, they're made up of di lots of different fibers. I'm just going to give a number. Let's say you have, this is not accurate, but just for argument's sake, let's say in your bicep, you have 100 fibers. That's total muscle fibers in your bicep. But when you do curls, your body's only really calling on 60 of them. Okay, There's going to be a big difference between your body calling upon 60 or recruiting 100. Mm -hmm. Part of what allows you to recruit more muscle fibers is how connected you are to the exercise, how stable you are to that exercise. This is why some people, not not all the reasons, but part of the reason why some people don't build their glutes as effectively doing squats as someone else or their chest as effectively when doing bench press as someone else. They're not able to recruit the same amount of muscle fibers because they're not as connected. They don't have that technique and the form. Mobility and priming is a very integral part of not just avoiding injury, but of maximizing your workouts so you can build the most amount well, of Well, and that dramatically adds up over time. Oh, so yeah. most people are following some sort of a routine where they have, you know, squats, bench press, whatever exercise we're talking about, where they have to do three to four sets of each exercise. Well, most people that don't do priming and set themselves up for all those exercises, to your point, only recruiting so much muscle fiber, sets one and two, they only get X amount percent out of that, mm -hmm. where they could potentially double or triple the amount they get out of all those sets. You add that up over workouts, over weeks and over months and over years, that really starts to compound. It makes a huge difference. So uh, maps, our program, Maps Prime, and Maps Prime Pro focus spe specifically on that. We do have a free webinar. I want to mention that so people can go and learn some of the stuff. They don't have to buy anything. It's uh, Maps Prime Pro, or excuse me, Maps Prime Webinar. Uh, dot com, so you can go there. Now, the second, then the next one is also very, very important. This one is one we communicate all the time, but I think it, you, we can't say it enough. Yeah. And that is, if you want to build muscle, focus on the most effective exercises. I mean, there's a lot of exercises. All of them have some value, but not all of them are equal. And when it comes to building muscle, they're definitely not equal. Some are really good at building muscle. Others are not very good at all at building muscle. The most effective exercises for building muscle are compound exercises or compound lifts. The term compound means 
you're you're using more than one joint when doing the lift. So a non-compound movement, a, an isolation movement, or a single joint exercise would be like a like a curl, right? A compound movement that would work the biceps would be like a chin up with my with my palms facing back in a supinated grip. That would be a compound lift for my biceps. Other compound lifts include squats, deadlifts, bench presses, overhead, overhead presses, press. rows, uh, horizontal presses. Those are all the big muscle building exercises. If you get good at those, you'll build way more muscle than if you get good at single joint and exercises. And of course, um, these are the ones that uh, require a bit more skill in terms of the performing of the exercise, where in a controlled setting where uh, you're in a machine, it's a lot of those things have been accounted for. And so it's great for rehab. It's great for being able to really hone in on very specific muscles. But when we're trying to build muscle, we need to send the loudest signal totally. we possibly can. And so these these types of lifts where we use multi-joint uh, really put a lot of demand on the body, which then in turn signal signals to the body, okay, we need to be able to build uh, some muscle to be able to resist this. Well, Sal, you gotta, you got to tell your, your speaker and amp analogy that you give a lot that we haven't talked about very very uh, much lately in the podcast because there is this movement right now in the the muscle building community around you know doing these exercises where you feel it the most in it yeah. and it and that's more important than these compound lifts in fact i know there's yep. a lot of, and there's very smart intelligent people that are, are promoting this message which i think is a terrible message for the masses which is this oh you know you don't need to do squats you don't need to do these compound lifts you can do exercises that target the quads or target the hamstrings or target the glutes, yep. glutes better but there's there's massive benefits that go into compound lifting for reasons. It's not just about feeling a specific muscle that's going to build the most muscle. There's also other benefits, uh, primarily talking about the central nervous system. Yeah. So the, the CNS is the controller, right? That's what tells your muscles to contract or relax. Uh, your brain is a part of the central nervous system, and the CNS would be like your amplifier if you were to have a stereo system. That's the amp. That's what sends the juice. And the speakers are like muscle. Well, you could have whatever speakers you want, but they're not going to do anything if the amp is, is very, very weak. And training your central nervous system leads to better muscle fiber recruitment and a louder muscle building signal. Compound lifts are a loud signal. Isolation lifts are not. You don't believe me? Go do a set of leg extensions to failure and then go do a set of barbell squats to failure and tell you how you feel <laughs> afterwards, right? It's a very loud, very big signal and it calls upon your body to elicit the strongest adaptation response. Remember, adaptation is what we're looking for when we're working out. Our body's trying to get better at what we're telling it to do. Compound lifts are just way more effective, partially because they activate so much muscle in the body. They tell everything to turn on. Your CNS is loud when, it's, when you're doing these exercises. And so it's like nothing's going to build more muscle. If you add 50 pounds to your squat... Look at how much muscle you build on your legs versus adding 50 pounds on a leg extension. I mean, there's no there's no comparison. A 50-pound add to your squat, you're going to see more muscle. 50 pounds on a leg extension, you might not even notice that much of a difference. That's how big of a difference it is when we're talking about these, these compound lifts. And for a lot of people who are training, if you're looking at your routine and you're like, why am I not building muscle? And you look at your workout and two-thirds of your workout is our single joint exercises, Okay, you got to flip that. Two thirds should be compound. One third should be the the, the single joint isolation yeah. uh, movement. Now, this next one is really funny. I'm gonna tell a story, kind of illustrate what what it's all about. I remember years ago, <laughs> I got this guy that that hired his kid. He was 17 years old, and he wanted to get bigger. He wanted to build more muscle. And so when he when I talked to him, he he wanted to hire me. And so we started talking about his routine. And it kind of sounded like he knew what he was talking about. And he was doing the right diet, taking the right supplements. And I said, well, let me look at your workout. And I looked at his workout and I quickly realized that he didn't spend much time training his legs. And so I asked him, I said, this is common for people, right? They'll, they'll not focus on a body part because it may be not flashy for them or whatever. Or and, it's hard. Or it's hard, right? right. <laughs> yeah. But legs is one, right? You know, the beach muscles, right? He's chest and biceps all the time. And, you know, my legs, I can wear pants. That was his whole deal. And he was a kid. So I said why aren't you working your legs that much? He goes, I don't really care about having super muscular legs, but what I want to do is I want to add more size to my arms. 
So I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to get you really strong at squats and build your legs. And he's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I said, oh, it will make sense once we do it. I said, but here's the deal. Your, we can build a body part and that body part will definitely build, but there's a signal that it sends to the whole body. You get this kind of whole body systemic effect. And I remember as a kid reading articles saying, if you wanted to get bigger arms, you got to get better at squats. And I thought it was silly, but I tested it myself as a kid. Totally worked. It worked on this kid too. His squat went up. Of course, his legs got bigger, but the rest of his body built as well. There are studies that show, for example, to kind of illustrate this, where they'll have somebody will, will they'll put one arm, they'll immobilize one arm. So your left arm immobilize. And when you do that, like if you have your arm in a cast, you'll notice lots of muscle loss. But in these studies, the, the participants will train the right arm. Mm -hmm. Here's what they find. The right arm definitely gets stronger. The arm that's immobilized loses less muscle. In fact, when they don't immobilize one of the arms, but they still train one arm, most of the gains go in that one arm they train. Some of the gains go in the other arm. It's like you get this you get this localized muscle building effect, right. but you also get this systemic muscle building effect. Now, we're, now let's talk about the legs for a second. That's a half of your body. Training your legs sends – definitely there's a, a local signal that goes to legs, but there's a very loud – systemic signal that goes to the rest of your body. Yeah, so call out the concept it's a radiation. Yeah. Uh, and so like as you as you like put stress in in on one joint, your body is still stabilizing, it's still actively contracting uh, and it's affecting your body in a lot more ways than you actually like realize. So so you training your legs definitely puts uh your your upper body is going to be affected by that in your overall body in general, the more type of demand you're going to put on, you're going to, you're going to build muscle as a result. Well, this is why too, I really like Sal, the, the speaker and amplifier analogy that you talk about too, because that, that makes total sense when you think of it like that too, mm -hmm. knowing that the legs are so big, if you are training those compound lifts and you're doing it, you're going to get some benefit to the amplifier. Yeah. So even though you didn't maybe upgrade the speakers in your arms, like you didn't get bigger speakers necessarily right away, but you're now sending a louder signal to those that because you've trained those lifts. So that's why I like that analogy so much because it makes sense to me that even if someone is not training that right arm like you're talking about and they're only training the left arm, mm -hmm. they're they're at least it still they're, stretches your capacity. That's out, right. They're right? still they're still, you know, they're still getting a better amplifier so that going forward when they do those other lifts, they're gonna get more bang for their buck. There is, it's true. And and so let's extend this this a little further. Don't skip body parts. Uh skipping body parts means that even though you have a body part that like, eh, I don't really care about training it that much. Yes, you're not going to develop that body part, but you're also not going to develop the other body parts to the full potential. Your body will limit the muscle building signal, number one, because it wants to maintain some sort of balance, and number two, because you're missing that systemic muscle building effect. So if you're training in a way that skips body parts, uh, you're actually limiting your capacity to build muscle, especially if it's a big body part. In guys, it tends to be legs. In women, it tends to be like chest. I've, got a lot of, I've had a lot of female clients. I don't need to train my chest. I'm like, but you want nice shoulders? You want nice back? Well, yeah. Well, let's train your chest and see what happens. And sure enough, they would notice better results uh, in the rest of the body. Uh, now, the next one, this one's important uh, because I think sometimes people, uh, especially people who want to build muscle, but they also are afraid of gaining body fat. They tend to shy away from carbohydrates. I tell you what, and this is coming from someone who often eats very, very low carbohydrates and sometimes even eats ketogenic. Now, I do those things because uh, not because I'm trying to build muscle and not because I'm trying to get lean, but rather it works on an individual basis for my gut health. This is why I do it. But believe me, if I had a choice, I would eat carbs, not just because they're delicious, but because you build muscle way easier when you build carbs. Oh, I mean, just, when you eat carbs, and it's also just easier to get the calories that way. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. really tough. Most people that struggle with building muscle yeah. also struggle with getting enough calories. I mean, I know this was where I was stuck for so many years. Was I was a trainer, I was active, I liked to play sports, I did all this stuff that was burning so many calories, and I just was not fueling the body enough carbohydrates to stay up with my caloric intake so that I can build. You can lift weights all day long, but if you're not giving the, your, your body enough calories to build muscle, it's going to have a really hard time putting any muscle yeah, on. Yeah, the other part to that, and this one's very obvious, is don't miss your protein intake. That is very That's important. why I like to target that first, right? Yeah. So like if I'm, for myself, this is even if I'm not tracking, like if I'm not logging everything I eat, 
the first thing I'll do is I'll go, okay, I'm just going to really focus on making sure I hit my protein intake. I'll just track my protein, make sure I hit my protein. And then I'll just, I'll, I'll pile on the carbohydrates and allow fat to get in there like mm -hmm. that. But if you hit that first and make sure you hit those numbers and then you pile on the other calories from carbs and fat, much easier strategy. Totally. Uh, the next one, this one is more for the hard gainer, the person who, uh, you know, has a tough time gaining weight. Daily weigh-ins can be really good. They can kind of keep you on track. This was a big one for me as a kid because I could see every single day what was going on. It also kept me on track with my uh, nutrition. Well, I think it's important too that we, you know, this episode is geared towards someone who's like a hard gainer. Yeah, it's like needs to be one. Because I, I know someone hears you say that and they're like, wait a second, I hear mind pump all the time. And they actually normally tell people right. like, don't get hung up on the scale. You got to remember who we're talking to right mm -hmm. now. I, I don't think that, you know, weighing every single day for the person who has body image issues and is got, you know, freaked out about the scale going up or down. This is for the person who is tr who's struggling to build muscle and being able to check in on the scale as far as an accountability piece to mm -hmm. see where you're at. There is tremendous value in doing it for that person. Now, well, and also to to make sure, like what kind of weight you're you're gaining. That's right. Uh, to and that's going to be highlighted most if you're gaining weight a bit too fast, and you know you're really looking at uh, your consumption versus uh, your activity levels, and to be able to um, see like not so much of of progress for a while is probably going to be the better approach, where you're recomp you're you're recomping your body, so now we're gaining more lean muscle. As yeah. And now there's one cause caveat to this, which is don't get hung up on the day-to-day -day changes. Look at the trends. You know, So I would chart this and I would see on a week-by-week -week basis the trends because daily you can lose or gain water. Also weigh yourself at the same time with the same clothes on or no clothes at all, uh, at all on because your body weight will fluctuate between morning and evening. But what you're looking for is the trend. If you get hung up on the day-to-day -day, you may find yourself, uh, you know, eating foods that promote water <laughs> retention or yeah. weighing yourselves, you know, at the end of the day because you're like, oh, I'm a little heavier at the end of the day to well, see what's going on. It's really there just to, like Justin said, to help you calibrate, right? Yeah. So if you've done a very good job, you're following a meal plan or you've figured out your macros and you know where you're supposed to be in order for you to gain muscle, mm -hmm. all right, you stick there. Now, what we know is that no, 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 even the best macro calculator out there is not precise to you. And this is where you use the scale as a tool for you to kind of measure like how accurate it was to you. So I've figured out where I'm supposed to be calorie and macro wise. And then I'm weighing every day to see. And what I'm really looking for is massive swings in one direction or the other. And then I'm adjusting accordingly. Like you said, if I see my scale go up four pounds, yeah. you know, consistently in two days in a row, okay, I probably need to scale back on my calories. Well, this is what's tough because we do have tools out there that are great, like our macro calculators and all these things that will help to give you some sort of structure, which is those numbers are useful. However, um, you, you have to individualize that even more by doing those other things, like by taking pictures, by also like, you know, weighing and measuring yourself uh, to be able to see how all these uh, work together and, and where you, you, you really are. Yeah. Now, the next one, this one, you were a big one on, Adam, which was a uh, food journal, yeah. keeping a food journal, writing down what you're eating. You know, what's funny with this one is even the, the hard gainers or the issue, the people have issues trying to put on muscle. They oftentimes overestimate oh, how totally. many calories or protein that they have. Protein is a big one. Like, oh, I eat a lot. I eat all the time. I have this. Uh, then you then they keep a food journal. We add it up. It's like, hey, man, you're 150 pounds. You're eating, you know, 70 grams of protein. Well, listen, we again. This is another one of those things that's kind of counter to some of the stuff that we we talk about on the on the podcast when we're talking in in general. This is a very specific targeted episode right. toward towards somebody who is a hard gainer or struggling to put on muscle or who wants to put on the most muscle as fast as you can. If you're trying to put on as mo as much uh, as much muscle as you possibly can as fast as you can, then these types of things, this is where this becomes important. Like you can't tell me that that's your goal and then you say, "Oh, I don't really feel like tracking though." Cuz then I'm going to challenge you. Say, well, we're not going to we're not going to build the most muscle the fastest if you're not willing to do that work because I've got to be able to track with you and then recalibrate if we need to. So that's why you want to do this. And then you, and to your point, Sal, almost everybody either overestimates or underestimates. I still to this day 
Like before I even started tracking just recently again, I was going, okay, I think I'm around this. Or I'm kind of guessing where I'm at. As soon as I start writing down, I'm always off a little Specific bit. Specific goals. I mean, they require just more attention to detail. And you, that's just the bottom line. I mean, there's there's a lot of healthy approaches out there where we can sort of uh, go through intuitively what I feel is good for my body and what I want to train for the day and all that kind of stuff for lifestyle. But when we're really trying to focus in on gaining muscle and like how to do that in the most you know efficient way possible, have to be really uh, uh, you know pay attention to those details. It's also going to help you dial in the the weight thing, right? If you if you have figured out your macros and you know right where you're supposed to be and you don't see the scale going, I don't care what the macros macro calculator said if you see the scale going down every single day you, you got more yeah you need more calories you you uh, it underestimated how much you're burning so that's why you have to do this tracking it doesn't mean you got to track for the rest of your life but especially when we are first building this routine or trying to get you started in the right direction we've got to figure all this stuff out yeah now this next one this one's for the people that are challenged with eating enough calories uh, i was one of these uh, people myself i had a very fast metabolism hmm. it's very ch once i started to kind of track I realized, wow, I'm not eating enough. I need to eat much more. How am I going to do this? I'm full. It's hard to consume. And that's when adding liquid calories actually makes a difference. Of course, remember, we're talking to a specific person right now. But adding liquid calories can make a huge difference. Protein shakes are a great example because they give you the protein that you might be missing and you get extra calories. If you're not dairy intolerant, milk is incredible for this. This is great, especially for the person who really struggles with put, putting on any body weight. It's like, how about this? Eat what you're normally eating. Just have a big glass of whole milk with every single meal. Boom, they added three or 400 calories to the diet and some high quality protein. Well, this is one of my favorite ways to, to gain right here is that my goal is, and I'm tracking, is, is to hit my protein in targets, get all the calories I'm spo supposed to with whole foods within the day, right? So that's my goal. And then at the end of the day is where I love to make like this bulking type of shake. Then I look at the end of the day and I go, okay, I was supposed to get to 3,500 calories. I just got to there. I just hit barely my protein intake. Now I'm going to have like this bulk shake at the end of the night. And for somebody who struggles with eating enough calories, things like this become extremely beneficial. And I have, I think I've shared this one on the podcast before where you go whole milk, uh, uh, whey protein, a banana, one tablespoon of Nutella, two tablespoons of peanut butter, all blended on ice. Like, damn, uh, that sounds good. It is. Yeah. It's like an eight hundred calorie, eight hundred calorie shake. It's like forty something grams of protein, depending on what way you're using, and it tastes phenomenal. It's a great way to end the night. It's also great for somebody that it may be like me who likes ice cream or sweets, and so it gives me kind of that sweet taste. But then I'm also getting this big punch of protein at the end mm. of the night. Now, this next one is funny. It's a challenge whether you're trying to lose weight or gain weight, or no matter what your goals are. I tend to find that people tend to go off on the weekends, mm. right? So like people who are trying to lose weight, they often find that on the weekends they go off and eat too much. People trying to pack on muscle and size do the same thing, just in the reverse. Like they do really well Monday through Friday, then the weekend comes, they sleep in, so that means they skip breakfast or lunch wasn't that structured. And next thing you know, their calories are low, their protein is low. And remember, it's, it's all averaged out, right? So if you're in a calorie surplus, you know, of 500 calories Monday through Friday, but then you're in a deficit of 1,000 on Saturday and Sunday, well, that means that you're you're barely in a surplus for the whole week I like because the weekend makes a big difference. I like this tip a lot because you're right. It does work both directions. And this actually happened way later in my career. I started to, to piece this together. It didn't matter if I was on a bulk or a cut. I just started to say, okay, I'm not going to tell myself I can't have these these foods during the week. I'm going to stop just doing it on Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. and I'm going to start making Saturday and Sunday my more dialed in days. And then if I want to have these other things or I want to take a day off from lifting, I'm going to schedule those days mm -hmm. somewhere in the week. And what I found would happen is when I organized my weekends, when I got work and I got all these things that are already scheduled in my day during the week, I'm much better on the diet. I'm more consistent with my workouts. So if I just made it a goal that I'm going to be dialed, on the weekends and I said and then I'll give myself flexibility if I want it or the freedom to take a day off or whatever during the week 
what I found was I was more consistent yeah. when I did this that. This is just true with any goal. I mean, that, that I've found in my career and with, with clients in general, it's just third, during the week, uh, people are just tend to be more structured yep. and, and have that going for them. And so they could just add this in. They're more regimented about it. Uh, if this is a specific goal of yours, to be able to carry that into the weekend is going to do wonders for you. Yes. Uh, now, this last one, boy, did this take me a long time to, to figure out. How long did it take you guys – to figure out the sleep component when it came to putting on muscle. Oh man, that wasn't until forever. Way, yeah, it wasn't until way later because I was the. I mean, we've openly. I'll sleep when I'm dead. That's right. Yeah. We openly have discussed the the young twenty year olds that we all were and all saying that uh, sleep is overrated and I'd work out and do things till late at night yep. and get up super early every. So I didn't realize what because it's one of those ones that it's not like. You can get away with not going yeah, to bed early, and you so don't, you think that you're fine. Yeah, you don't see a swing in any direction right away. It's not like you get one bad night of rest, and then the next day you lose right. five pounds of muscle. Right. It's, it's got a compounding effect, and the body is resilient as shit, so it'll adapt to whatever you make it do all the it'll, time. It'll, you'll be able to get through your day, That's right. and you'll be able to take a pre-workout and get your workout, but are you maximizing? No. I remember when I first kind of started to peer into this. I still didn't learn my lesson. But I did enjoy some incredible benefits. I would, I had been reading articles and books, and I remember I had read a few books, and each one of them made this big deal about getting enough sleep. And and I remember finally saying, "All right, let me see what the deal." Because I I was one of those kids that like I could get away with five hours of sleep, and I was totally fine. I thought, "Oh, this is this is not for me." Well, anyway, I remember thinking, "That's it. This the next thirty days, I'm going to make a concentrated effort to go to bed early to sleep." At least eight hours every single night, which was a big improvement for me, and to see what happens. And sure enough, I gained like four or five pounds of muscle in that month. Now, the reason why I didn't keep doing it is because I was a hard-headed kid, and you know, sleeping is boring, and being awake, there's all kinds of things you could do. Later on as an adult, I put this together, uh, and it's important, and it's, it's important for many other things aside from just building muscle. But I, I tell you right now, especially hard gainers. I'd say probably seven out of 10 times, 70% of the time when someone comes to me and says, man, I just, my body doesn't yeah. build muscle. Sleep is always an issue. Like 70% of the time I look at their sleep and I go, oh, well, you're only sleeping six hours Oh, you don't value it until you can't get it anymore. <laughs> it's just like everything else, you know? Like I didn't really realize the power of it until uh, I, I couldn't sleep as much and I had to get up and I had to do all these, I was, all these responsibilities now that I had in front of me, uh, you know, didn't allow me to sleep and, and, and go through that like I, I used to. But um, it, again, it was always like I, I was working against my body is how I felt when I wasn't getting sleep. So it didn't even matter if I was young and resilient and all those things. I could have benefited from it massively if I would have applied a, a structure to that where I had a, an allotted amount of time for me to sleep and recover. It was like I'm always like playing that catch up game, which I'm sure a lot of uh, young people can relate well, to. Well, wouldn't you say, Sal, too, that a big part of that, too, is just what's going on hormonally and like with uh, insulin and cortisol? Oh, and, like, man. I mean, those are su those are such key indicators on you building muscle or burning body fat and when you are when your sleep is off when your circadian rhythm is off that throws a lot of that off and so big time right and to your body telling your body that it's going to build muscle or burn body fat when those are all out of whack is just really Look, tough if someone if someone gave me if someone made a bet with me and gave me money and said uh how let's see how fast you could lower your testosterone or someone else's testosterone, and you can only do one thing. The one thing I would do is do sleep deprivation. It's guaranteed to hammer your anabolic hormones. Your growth hormone goes to shit. Your testosterone totally drops. Cortisol goes up. Your body actually primes itself to reduce muscle and store body fat. Lots and lots of literature on the connection between bad sleep and fat gain or bad sleep and performance uh, reductions. Sleep really primes the body with these beneficial hormones, hormones that oftentimes people take exogenously to build more muscle. You know, you produce less melatonin, which means you produce less growth hormone, which now means your body's becoming, you know, it's not going to burn body fat as well. Your insulin sensitivity starts to drop. Insulin's also very anabolic. In women, you see these, these imbalances between estrogen and progesterone just from not getting great sleep. And by the way, it's not just getting terrible sleep that does that. It's getting anything less than optimal. You right. start to see those changes. Literally. So it is a spectrum, meaning the best you get, the best sleep you get gives you the best results. Anything less than that is less than that. 
So it's not just the difference between great sleep and shitty sleep. Right. It's like, well, you know, I get seven hours or six and a half, but I think I'm okay. It'd be a big difference just by by prioritizing it, getting eight hours and allowing your body to kind of prime itself for you to build muscle. Now, a big part of this game is the mental game, right? We always talk about how you're, you play mind games with yourself. If you're, if you're gaining and you're losing, I'm not sure. I look at myself in the mirror every single day. I can't tell. This is why I, I love using this episode. If you're somebody who struggles with building muscle and you think or you think you're not building muscle, use this as a checkoff list and start checking off all these things. Mm -hmm. If you're doing all these things, I promise you're heading in the right direction. If you're doing all these things and you're following a good program and a routine, I promise the body, the body composition is changing. You're probably building muscle. Hopefully you're also burning some body fat. So even if you're not seeing this huge fluctuation on the scale or you're not getting people to every single day complimenting you and telling you you're getting massive and building all kinds of muscle the next day, be patient, stay with it, and just get good at all 11 of these things. Very well said. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free stuff that we offer all of our listeners. Great, great free information, mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Are there some generic parameters as far as what you would tell them to you know, stay your saturated fat under this or th it should be only this person? You know, it really doesn't even matter. So here's the other thing. If you're in a calorie deficit and you're losing weight, you're everything else makes no difference. Like all your cardiovascular risk factors that we can measure go down. Like they've done studies where people are in a 